This morning, we are continuing a sermon series that is entitled, Growth on Purpose. Here's what I want to say at the outset. I'm going to say it every week. The ways in which humankind grows, unless we are doing something intentionally, is very rarely positive. In order to grow in a positive way, it takes purposefulness. And especially in the area of our hearts and our spiritual lives, growth is something that happens on purpose. Last week, we took a quick look at some scripture. And the scripture that we looked at last week was scripture that involved the idea of being a group of people who follow the example of Jesus. So the idea here would be this, that we would be a group of people who would think about Jesus in our lives and what he has done for us. And last week, we took a look at the passage of Scripture that referenced to us the idea that Jesus presented to us four types of soil. The soil that was presented to us involved us being a group of people who look at that and then recognize that in the midst of God showing us that, that it takes soil prep in order for us to be a group of people where the seed of the gospel actually grows deeply in our hearts and our lives. Not only this, but we talked about how Jesus often withdrew and went to lonely places where he prayed. And the challenge last week was this, is that each one of us would become involved in doing this. That growth track, which you've heard about, is essential. Being part of a life group is essential. Being part of a church family, being involved with a campus ministry on grounds is essential. But ultimately, each one of us needs an environment where we go away and we spend time alone with Christ. We shared with you this first15.org, which is a wonderful website that will send you a daily devotional via email so that you can click on it and have a time of scripture reading, a devotional thought in worship. This morning, what I want to talk about is growth on purpose. Growth on purpose, and the subtitle is Your Name Here. The idea is is that are you and I willing to be the types of people where we're going to grow spiritually on purpose? In order to do that, I want to begin with an Older Testament scripture. And the Older Testament scripture is this. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. It's where we are open to the thoughts of other people where we are open to the voice of the Spirit speaking to us and through us. Now, I have to admit to you that when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a time in my own life where I did not listen to the advice of one of my neighbors. I should have. He's a builder and has been a master builder for the past 40 years. And I was in the middle of building a wall at my house right outside the kitchen window. I wanted to give my wife a little bit of a gift. And so I was building this wall, and he walked up to me one day, and he said, Pete, how many courses of brick are you going to go up? And I said, I'm going up five. That's the measurement. He said, you do realize that if you go over three courses of brick, you actually need to tamp down the ground underneath it, put sand underneath it, put drainage behind the wall, put gravel in it, tamp it again, and then build your wall. I thought, well, I haven't planned on that. <laughs> and who is he? <laughs> so that was in July of 2009. Now here's a picture of the wall as it now looks. It didn't go bad overnight. It took time. But little by little, the wall has begun to sag, and that's now what my wife looks at every day <laughs> when she sits at the kitchen sink. You see, a fool views what they're doing as right, and when advice comes, they say, no thank you. Now, here's what I want to say as we move towards our newer Testament scripture. Here's what is told to us in the book of James. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. What are the next four words? 
Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he or she looks like. I've got a prop. This is a mirror. There's an extension cord right front there, Jay. Oh, here it is. Let me plug this in. I was at Costco with my oldest daughter. She said, Daddy, that mirror is a great deal. It's only 20 bucks. She wanted one. So I got one for me as well. (laughs) You see, the book of James says that if you look at yourself in the mirror and do not do what it says, you're like someone who has, or you look at the scriptures and then you look in a mirror and you don't really respond to it, that you are a person who needs help. So what I did was I brought this mirror home. Man, I love it because it's just kind of a regular mirror. It's really, really cool. And then I found out There's a light, too. My goodness. (laughs) Little too much light, actually. But here's the part I did not know. It's got a mirror that magnifies 10 times. Have you ever noticed how big your pores are (laughs) when you look in there and hair follicles and I was looking at myself and I know this is going to be a little extreme, but my nose hairs look like a forest. Um, I needed to shave. Every little blemish began to come out. You know what I did was I looked in the mirror, turned on the light, looked very intently, and realized I needed a face peel or something. Something had to change. Now, the reality of it is, In the time of the Apostle Paul and Jesus in the writing of the book of James, mirrors were rare. They were extremely expensive. They weren't glass, they were polished metal. And only the mega wealthy had them. And so if you ever had the opportunity to look in a mirror, you would look and you would study yourself and you'd memorize what you look like. And if something needed to change, when you exit that environment, you would do whatever change needed to be made. But here's what the apostle, I'm sorry, the book of James tells us. The book of James tells us this, that we are to do what it says. Maybe you like I am at times where I read scripture. And as I'm reading scripture, I think to myself, wow, that is great for someone else. Kind of like this sermon. You're sitting here listening to this sermon and you're thinking to yourself, my goodness, I wish that irritating person that claims to be a Christian that lives in my office would be here this morning to hear this sermon because they need it so badly. The Bible says this is now about you. It's about you being willing to be a person that gets in front of that mirror and is willing to look at it and do what it says. Now, what's fascinating is that phrase, do what it says, is one Greek word. It's the Greek word where we get poet or poetry from. It's where that word comes from. And so the idea is, in the mind of James, is that you will look at Scripture and not defying how it's relayed to us in the Bible, but you will look at it and you will creatively own it for yourself. So whatever you read in the scripture in your time, through maybe through uh, the first15.org and you're reading the scripture, you're going through worship and you find some passages of scripture, the idea is you're going to do what it says, but you own it creatively and you apply it to your own life. I've experienced this over and over again. But again, oftentimes when I'm reading scripture or I'm thinking about a sermon like this one, I think to myself, my goodness. I wish that so-and-so were here and that they would look in the mirror. In order to help us with that, Jesus has something to say. And here's what Jesus said. 
Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? You hypocrite. What a great word. Hypocrite. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So what does that mean? That means there are times where I come before God's word and I allow myself to look in the mirror of it and I deal with what I need to deal with in my own heart, in my own life. Now what I want to do is spend the vast majority of this sermon putting feet to our faith. Here's why. I would like for us to seriously consider what Scripture has to say. And it's this. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul tells us what I think is the key verse that we need to focus on and look into the mirror of this morning. This is the verse. It's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Here's what it says to us. That scripture says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When you begin to read this verse, instantly the, two first, the, two, the first two highlighted words that I've got up in front are conform and transform. These words are exceptionally important if we're going to understand what's being said to us by the Apostle Paul through Scripture. I want to start with the idea of conform. If you were to read this accurately in Scripture, you would discover that Paul's concern for those people that are in the Roman church is this. This is key to understand. He is concerned about them and their walk with Jesus because they are being conformed by the pressures of this world. In other words, they're out there living just like you are and just like I am. And by the sheer fact that we live in the world the way we do, there's this pressure, there is external pressure to make us do certain things, live certain ways, and have certain views. Please understand this, that conformity happens from outside pressure. Literally, it could say this, that the world is trying to make you be poured into its mold that there's kind of this picture that you're supposed to fit into and no matter who you are or where you're from, there's external pressure to become a certain thing and that's being dictated by the world. Biblically speaking though, the world more often than not stands in opposition to what Christ wants for us. So Paul says to the church in Rome, Paul says to me as I look into the mirror of the scriptures, am I a person that is conforming to the world or am I the type of person that's being transformed from the inside out? We'll get to that in a moment. But as I thought about conformity and I thought about the area that I'm seeing As a local pastor, where I am watching a lot of followers of Jesus conform to the world instead of being transformed from the inside out, and I'm going to say it as carefully as I can, it's a word called politics. I don't talk about politics in this church. We talk about Jesus. But here's what I have seen. I've seen a lot of followers of Jesus respond to politics the way the world calls you to respond to politics and the not the way Jesus does. I have watched fo- people that follow Jesus literally begin to say incredibly painful, accusatory, negative things against anyone who does not hold their political view. The harshness of it And some of what I've heard and seen written on social media is shocking. Because I would say, quote that and then put Jesus after it. 
And suddenly, it's totally wrong, categorically wrong, because you and I are called to follow Jesus, not to conform to the world. The next time you go to post something, I want you to ask, will this bring people to Christ, or is it going to bring more division? The next time you go to tweet something, is it going to bring positive reality into this world or is it going to be totally negative? What is it going to be? Because look, the world in in which we live is calling us to conform to a mold where you're going to have to be fractured and broken and division is everywhere. That's not the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus is that you and I would respond to the things that we are passionate about in a way where we are for something, not against something. And we do it with wisdom and with kindness, with honesty, but with sensitivity and with love. Again, as a local church pastor, and I know many of my colleagues in Charlottesville are getting alarmed about this as well, the way Christians are processing the political scene, we are being conformed, not transformed. Now, the idea of being transformed is the Greek word metamorphosis. And what that means is, is that through us following Jesus, instead of being conformed by the world, we are being transformed from the inside out, just like a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. So literally the word that the Apostle Paul uses is the word that means metamorphosis, but I want us to catch something that you can't see in the English, and it's this. When the Apostle Paul writes about do not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, he uses these tenses and voices and moods. You can't catch it in English, but here it is in the original language. First of all, it's in what's called the passive voice in Greek. That means that when you are being transformed, you are not doing it. The Holy Spirit in the Word of God is working within you. So when you get alone in that environment that you get alone with God in, just like Jesus did frequently, you're doing the same. When you get alone with the Word of God and the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you, it's what's called the passive voice. In other words, it would be like this. If I would say to you, yesterday I drove to the store, that would be active voice. If I said to you, yesterday I was driven to the store by someone else, that's passive voice. I'm involved, I'm making decisions, but someone else is doing the work. That's the idea of metamorphosis and being transformed. Present tense means this. It's not a one-time deal. It's not just about coming on Sunday. It's not about just being part of your life group. It's not being part of your core group on grounds at UVA. It's about present tense. This is something that must happen very frequently. Next is in the imperative mood. It's a command. The Apostle Paul to the church of Rome and to you and to me isn't suggesting it. He's commanding this. If you and I are going to have growth on purpose, spiritually, we must be a group of people who are looking at how we're being called to conform to the world, being pressed into its mold, and instead we are choosing to be transformed by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God, and in that, it's not a one-time deal. It's something that happens present tense. It's a continual thing. Now, I want to be honest about this. In my own heart and in my own mind, There are times where I will read something or see something on the media and instantly I can feel my heart getting angry and negative. It's in that moment that I must make a choice that the Holy Spirit is going to do a work inside of me and through me because when Pete Hartwig's flesh comes to the surface, it never brings about what Christ wants. Never. Never has. Never will. 
But when I surrender to the Holy Spirit and I make that decision, I become passive. The Holy Spirit does a work in me. He's doing it on a continual basis, and it's the command of Scripture. Now, here's what Paul writes. He says, instead of being conformed and pressed into the world's mold, I'm being transformed. There's a metamorphosis that's happening by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. I can promise you this, that if you are living on grounds at UVA, if at any point you exit your home, if at any point you turn on the news media, if at any point you connect with anyone but yourself, you will need your mind renewed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? All you want to do is go to Harris Teeter and get a quart of milk. And by the time you come back, you can feel at times like you're frustrated, you're a little bit sideways, maybe you've had some thoughts, whatever the case may be. But the Apostle Paul says that the Spirit of God is available for renewing our mind. In other words, having the ability to have a paradigm shift that moves towards who Jesus is. Now, the last part of that phrase or that verse of Scripture fascinates me. The Apostle Paul says this, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be squeezed into its mold. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you, allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you, allowing Scripture to speak to your heart. And then he goes on to say, then you will be able to, to, be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know what I've found? Oftentimes, when I offer to pray with followers of Jesus, they'll say to me, hey, Pete, I want you to pray with me so that I'll know what God's will is for my life. Paul said, you can do that yourself. That if we allow the Spirit of God to be transforming our minds, you are able to test and approve what God's will is for your life, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, I'm not opposed to praying with anyone for God's will. But I've literally, over the years, I've been in ministry 30 years, had couples that have approached me, and they've said this to me. Hey, Pete. Yes. Can you tell us if it's God's will that we get married. <laughs> you know what I say? I pull the guy aside. I tell him this. First of all, I'm not going to wake up next to her 20 years from now. Don't ask me that question. Number two, I think you, before you get into married, need to have that assurance in your own heart. Because you're going to have to lead your family spiritually. And if you can't figure this one out, I'm not so sure you should get married. Just saying. Now, I'm willing to pray with the couple. I'm willing to even fast and pray that God would reveal. But what the Apostle Paul tells us is this, is that by having a transformed mind, a metamorphosized mind through the Scripture and through the Holy Spirit, I can begin able to test and approve God's will for my life. Now, some people would say this, well, what is Billy Graham? What, what would Billy Graham think? What would Billy, Billy Graham say? Billy Graham's dead. He's gone. Not here. Then you might start thinking, well, what would Charles Stanley say? Or what would Andy Stanley say? They don't know you. Well, what about Pastor Pete? I already told you what I'm going to say. That's something that I believe God can speak to you. You know what my heart is for all of us here at City? Is that when we go through growth on purpose, that we would not conform to the pattern of this world, but instead we'd be being transformed by the renewing of our mind so that you, as an individual in Christ, would have the assurance that you know God is with you, you would know what God is saying to your heart and saying to your life, and each day you would have confidence that you would test and approve 
what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your own life, that you would know what that is. Now, we began by saying, do what it says. So when we talk about putting feet to our faith, I'm going to ask that you would grab this card that you were handed as you came in the door. And as you grab this, I'm going to ask that you would take it out because there are two apps that you can utilize. One of them is, is the one on the right is the good news. It's daily reminders of your worth in Christ. Some of us, when we sit in front of the mirror of God's word, all we think we're going to see are our faults. Not the case. The first thing that will, Jesus will say to you is how much he loves you. How much he cares for you. How much he loves you, he died for you and your value and your worth to him. This app will give you a biblical thought each day that will help you in that area if you struggle. And the other app that we're promoting through this handout is one where you can make your own little scripture placards. So if there are certain scriptures you know speak to your heart and to your life that you'll have the ability to make those and use those. The other thing that I want to make mention of is something that you're hearing constantly at City, and that's Growth Track. Growth Track will help you to understand how God has made you, what City Church is all about, our vision and our mission. And we are asking that every single person would prayerfully consider going through Growth Track. The information for that is on the back side of the card that you were handed as you came in. If you are sensing that God is calling you to growth on purpose, I want to encourage you, even challenge you, that you will utilize this card, that you'll commit to being a part of growth track, and you'll be prepared to grow, grow on purpose. This morning, we're going to move towards something that's very special. We have three individuals that have made the choice to follow Jesus. And in the midst of that, they're going to be baptized in water with us, their church family. And so what I'm going to ask that you would do now is please stand with me. We're going to take a moment to worship together, and then we're going to celebrate these three people as they're baptized in water. Let's worship Jesus. Let's worship him with all of our hearts. And could it be that we're a group of people as we get ready to worship? that we'd be a group of people who are now open to the present working of the Holy Spirit. That as you worship this time, that you would close your eyes and open up your heart so that during worship, it wouldn't just be words that you're singing to God, but you would allow those words to come from the depths of your soul. That you would allow those words to capture your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you to stand in God's presence in the midst of worship and allow the Spirit of God to transform and to renew your mind so that instead of being pressed into the world's mold, you are being renewed in your mind through the words that you're singing and the worship that you're bringing to God. Let's take the next few moments as we prepare for water baptism to worship God and allow the Spirit of God to speak to us and to minister in us and through us. At this time, we're going to be celebrating. You can be seated. We're going to be celebrating with three people who are going to be baptized in water. Thank you, Matt. This is a very special time for the individuals who will be baptized in water. So at this time, I'm going to ask that Mary Moffitt would come on up here. Mary, if you would come on up. Let's give her a hand as she comes. She'd hold my hand, step right up inside there, and then step down over here. Good job. Hello, Mary. Do you want to share something? Sure. I'm going to hand you this microphone. Do not drop it in the water. Okay. <laughs> um, this is really important to me because God has changed me so much, and I'm really excited just to tell everyone about it. 
Thank you, Mary. So, Mary, have you made the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. So, Mary, because of your profession of faith and your confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, I'm now going to baptize you. So if you'll cover up like that, turn this way. Go ahead and be seated. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go ahead and hold my hand. Next, this is Amy Berger. Amy, come on up. Let's give her a hand as she comes. Step all the way forward. So this is my friend Amy. And we've known each other for a while, haven't we? And Amy is a widow. She lost her husband. How long ago did you lose Connie? Yesterday. It was one year. So it was one year ago yesterday. Her husband passed away from cancer. And she has, in the midst of this, found God's grace, God's peace. It's not without its struggle, though, is it? Oh, for sure. Yes. But in the midst of that, she's really found Christ, really moving with her and giving her strength and peace. I would tell you this publicly, that your husband was a wonderful man. You know that. And he was just a brilliant scientist at UVA. And, uh, but Amy wanted to move towards water baptism to give a public expression of what Christ has done in her life. Would you like to share anything? You did a great job. I did a great job, okay. I kind of had a feeling that was coming. So I wanted to share a little bit of your story so that people could have context. So Amy, have you chosen to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes, I have. Because of your confession of faith and your profession that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life, I'm going to baptize you. So if you'll be seated at this time. So Amy, because of your profession of faith and your confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you. And next is Tyler Donegan. Tyler, if you'll come on up here, let's give Tyler a hand as he comes. I'm going to hold your hand just to help you to get in. If you'll step all the way forward. There you go. Is there something that you would like to share? Here you go. So I was brought up in church, and um, but I wasn't lived a Christian life. Um, I questioned my salvation multiple times throughout my life. And started to be convicted this past year and wanted to change and I started to see God and for real and repent of my sins and he baptized me in the Holy Spirit and I've been the same since. Good deal. Thank you, Tyler. So if you go ahead and be seated. So Tyler, because of your profession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, and that you've confessed that from your heart through your lips, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's give these three people a hand again. Would you stand with me as we close out our time? We are going to close out our time by reading a prayer from the book of Ephesians. We're going to read it together out loud. But as we do that, I want you to picture the Apostle Paul praying for us. That for centuries, Followers of Jesus and pastors and missionaries have prayed this prayer over people for 2,000 years. 
And so as that prayer is put up on the screen, I want us to pray it out loud together. Because I think this prayer really captures this growth on purpose. And that you and I would be looking to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I love Paul's prayer here. So can we read it out loud together, but make it a prayer over your own heart and your own life, as well as those that you know and love. So let's read it out loud. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's read it. I keep asking that the Lord God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. How about we say amen? amen? Say it one more time. Amen. amen. And now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to turn towards you. And may he give you his peace. Amen. Amen. And amen. Turn and give someone a high five, a hug, or a handshake. God bless you. Amen.